Hello, folks. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Marble Palace. I'm Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Regina Lear Post. With me back from, I guess, a little bit of time off, Arthur White Crummy, our legislative reporter for the Leader Post, Star Phoenix, and uh, Lynn Giesbrick, who is works for Leader Post and has frequently covered COVID, and including this week's announcement, including the goings on in Regina. Uh, and to put perspective in uh, terms of the last press conference and what Mo said, I think we actually have to begin with a little bit of background about how big a problem it is in Regina. Uh, you were blessed to do the weekend stories, <laughs> as, as you are, for, for the newspaper. Uh, before we get into what Mo said, didn't say, and maybe should have said, according to many critics, what is it that is the problem in terms of the Regina spread and maybe more critically how it seems to quite possibly be rapidly spreading new variants of COVID to neighboring uh, communities like Moose Jaw and communities in Southeast uh, Saskatchewan. What did you see on uh, the in the weekend numbers carried through to Monday, Tuesday? Yeah, I mean, no one is surprise now to hear variants of concern. That's obviously the problem. Um, so Regina over Saturday and Sunday cumulatively actually added more cases overall and more cases of variants of concern than all the other regions of the province combined, which is like, yeah, Regina, what are you doing? But um, yeah, so lots of cases happening there. Uh, so it was like 252 cases overall and 153 had been identified as variants of concern. And there's like some yeah. Not necessarily overlap specific. It's can, not necessarily can you, three of can those, you explain but, yeah. why, Lynn, we're seeing so many in Regina? Because everybody keeps asking me that, and I never have a really great answer. So if, from what uh, they have told you elsewhere in terms of, of doing the stories, can you just offer a broad outline as to why Regina seems to be the home of this, these new variants? It's honestly really, really hard to say for sure. I mean, initially when Regina started going crazy, Dr. Shahab was saying like workplaces, workplaces are where we're starting to see this because with variants of concern, um, you know, old measures and protocols that workplaces had established weren't working as well anymore. So things were spreading far easier. And if there was any kind of lapse in protocols at workplaces and people were getting a little too close or taking their masks off in break rooms or anything like that, suddenly it was spreading way faster. Um, but it seems to have moved far beyond just workplaces now. Um, and it's basically just a rampant community transmission. So it's hard to pinpoint now exactly where that's happening. And the last time I looked, we had more than half the active cases in the province in Regina. And I don't know if we've ever seen that since maybe the days of Lalash, where one community has been so responsible for such a high proportion of uh, the active cases. Uh, but were that not problematic enough, we're now sort started seeing the same active case increase in the southeast and in Moose Jaw and, uh, and obviously uh, communities, I think, like Weber and Nesvin. Is there any particular uh, um, uh, explanation as to why it is spreading there and what did or didn't uh, the government do on Tuesday with Dr. Shahab and Premier Mo in terms of addressing those particular issues related to the spread? Yeah, again, I think it's really hard to pinpoint that like, oh, the spread is happening in this particular place. Like I am, Dr. Shahab and Premier Scott Mo have always said like, you know, eventually we're just gonna have variants of concern everywhere. It's kind of inevitable if we don't get vaccines out fast enough, um, they're just gonna spread. And so I think it's the same thing. Like they've, they've ended up in Moose Jaw and a lot of Southern parts of the province. Weyburn is also an area of concern right now. Um, and once they're there, you've got a couple of cases of variants. It just takes those little laps in protocols, right? Like just a few people not social distancing or people not being careful when they're gathering and it spreads way faster now. So I think it's just like, yeah, people are doing all the same things they were before necessarily, but it's just not enough against variants of concern. Um, and so Moose Jaw has really um, become an area of concern over the last few days, um, probably last week actually. Weyburn is increasing too, but all of Southern Saskatchewan is basically kind of under a warning in a sense of like, hey, you need to be really careful right now or you're going to end up like Regina. Um, and so a lot of people were calling for restrictions like Regina has in Moose Jaw specifically yesterday. And that's not something the premier was considering at the time. He said there's, well, Dr. Schaub said there's active discussions going on to see if that's needed. But at this point in time, they're not bringing anything in and they're basically relying on people to step up their own 
protocols and go above and beyond the health orders that are in place in the hopes of avoiding more restrictions there. I heard two strange things or two contradictorily strange things yesterday. One is the red alert from Dr. Shahab and one another was from Premier Mo saying, I think we can deal with this without being on red alert in essence, basically saying we can deal with this by uh, being careful, taking personal responsibility, uh, etc. I take it that's the message that you're suggesting that he's uh, being challenged on, being criticized for uh, quite uh, significantly in certain circles, particularly in the medical yeah. committee. Yeah, because he was asked several times if, like, what was happening, why are we not getting restrictions in Moose Jaw? And I think he came out with the strongest statement that I've heard from him today of, like, restrictions are a last resort. And he was basically like, I don't want more restrictions anywhere ever, basically. And so he's like, I'm relying on people to do the right thing. And it's interesting because he said something very similar before Regina had more restrictions put on it. And we kind of all saw how well that worked out for the city. Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure why he feels it's a good idea to say the same thing about Moose Jaw now. Um, cause I, yeah, it seems like Moose Jaw is heading in the same direction that Regina is. Seems a good place to bring Arthur in because Lord knows you've done as many stories on the conflict between, um, uh, the province not really wanting to have as strict restrictions as people want as other provinces have versus uh, Moe's narrative, which pretty much has been, uh, let's move towards vaccines, let's uh, uh, get ahead of it uh, with vaccines without having to impose any more stricter restrictions, as Lynn said, than we have to. Uh, the problem with that, as I see it, is that it's not an even race. You, uh, The problem being is that you can vaccinate a lot of people, like hundreds of people in a community, thousands of people in a community. But if you see the number of infections, as we're seeing in Regina, which is in the neighborhood of 100 a day, or if you see uh, a mounting death toll, which fortunately we haven't seen to any huge extent, but we are seeing a few numbers creep up, it becomes hugely problematic for uh, uh uh, the premier. So Arthur, I guess going into the spring sitting and, 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 and other issues related to this, what problems does the premier face particularly now? And let's start with AstraZeneca, because right now we're in a situation where, to no fault of his own, uh, we're seeing restrictions on, uh, uh, recommended restrictions on AstraZeneca use to people over 55 years as opposed to under 55 years. That's got to hurt the government strategy of getting a lot of people uh, vaccinated. And certainly they've invested heavily in the strategy with this stick it to COVID campaign that they've just released. Can you talk about that conflict in terms of how AstraZeneca might affect that plans to, to roll out a lot of vaccine numbers and, and where we seem to be at in terms of uh, the premier's success in the vaccine campaign? Yeah, I mean, it was really uh, terrible timing in terms of uh, this new uh, recommendation out of the federal committee that handles vaccination oversight, uh, saying that uh, from henceforth, until we have better data, uh, we're going to try to restrict the AstraZeneca vaccine to people 55 and over because of some evidence coming out of Europe that there's a uh, a risk of blood clots uh, that, that that could in some cases be quite severe, particularly in women under 55. It's still unclear exactly how much of a risk this is. Some studies are saying it could be one in a million, some one in 100,000, some potentially a bit more common. But, uh, you know, NASI is just being prudent here, saying uh, let's take a step back and restrict it to those over 55 who are at the most risk of COVID and apparently at a lower risk of these blood clots uh, going forward until we know more about this. So it's prudent, but it's certainly gonna create some uh, logistical problems yeah. for the government in terms of their vaccine rollout. Uh, but it's also, I fear, gonna lead to some questions about confidence as people go forward deciding which vaccine they wanna take, even those over 55, are they gonna feel totally comfortable um, uh, accepting the AstraZeneca vaccine when it becomes available. And clearly, as you said, uh, the premier has staked a lot of his strategy on vaccinations, as he did in Regina, when we were seeing variants very much concentrated in just this one city to a large extent, targeting the AstraZeneca vaccines 
to Regina. We had that drive through that saw thousands and thousands of people coming in over uh, a one week period. Now the premier is saying we're going to uh, target the vaccines to some of these new communities where variants are spreading. Moose Jaw, Weyburn, even Yorkton, he said, uh, clearly are going to be cl places that are going to get a little bit more vaccine attention. Whether these logistical hurdles with the AstraZeneca vaccine are going to complicate that to some extent remains to be seen. We're really going to have a lot of vaccines pouring into the province over the next few weeks. Uh, over two weeks, 180,000 are expected, according to Premier Mo. Uh, and uh, that's more or about the same that we've had over the entire vaccine campaign thus far. That being said, about 50,000 of those are the AstraZeneca vaccine. So uh, whether that's going to uh, cause a little bit of a delay as we like retool or as people have second thoughts about whether they want to get AstraZeneca, uh, that remains to be seen. But Dr. Shahab was still very clear that for people over 55, the uh, benefits of AstraZeneca still outweigh the risk. And that's what everyone is saying across the medical community. So people really, as they're uh, reflecting about what vaccine uh, they want to have, they should keep that in mind. It's, it's a miserable question. To, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, uh, Lynn, but it's a miserable question to ask a reporter uh, as to how successful uh, they think a vaccine rollout is. But uh, I guess I'll begin with you, Arthur, and maybe you, if, if, if you'd like to add in to this, Lynn, it would be helpful. Is there some sense, particularly with you, Arthur, and, and you, Lynn, too, but both of you have been in the lineups watching people uh, uh, get vaccinated. Is Can you speak a little bit more to how successful the buy-in might be to what the Premier is proposing and, and whatnot? Because despite the fact that we do hear an awful lot of people say online or in social media or protesting in front of the legislature, I'm not getting the vaccine. I don't see that necessarily happening when yeah. I was lining up for four and a half hours. I think people are taking it pretty seriously and wanting to. Yeah. Is, is, is there concern that that might uh, diminish as your younger people? And so we'll start with the older people, me talking, and then you, Arthur, and then the youngest person in this conversation. Yes, so. yes. I, I mean, I'll, I'll be getting my vaccine well before Lynn. Uh, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think that that's, uh, that's certain. Uh, and of course, you've already had it, Murray. So, so, so. Uh, Is Lynn old enough to get a vaccine? I'm, I'm just, I can't remember the limits. Is it, it, <laughs> I'm 24 now. I'm okay, perfectly old enough. Okay, we just want to make yes, sure. Yes. Definitely. Sorry, uh, so, my, the sense I'm getting is that the vaccine rollout has been quite successful. We remain uh, the best, if not one of the best, uh, provinces in terms of the you know percentage of shipments that we have actually gotten into people's arms. It's 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 quite impressive. Uh, there seem to have been very few hiccups in that regard, uh, and uh, the uptake has been very high. Uh, I am continuously getting messages pouring into my inbox from people that are interested in getting the vaccine. It seems like there's a lot of interest. Uh, they are mostly elderly people. I think your question about whether that's going to be the same for younger people uh, who don't have the same risk factors is well taken. Uh, but we're not there yet. And uh, and uh, the AstraZeneca news uh, is something that kind of throws a wrench into this. But uh, that that's something that we're going to be very, watching very closely over the uh, weeks to come. What's your take on this, Lynn? Because I'm not asking you to speak for every person that's that's of uh, of your age or otherwise. But uh, I do think that when you get into certain demographics, particularly younger males, particularly people that uh, are of certain political persuasion in terms of hardcore beliefs about freedoms and liberties, et cetera, it gets a little bit more problematic. Does it get tougher for the vaccine rollout from here, from what you've observed in terms of people that you've talked to for stories? Is there an emerging pattern in terms of uh, what you are seeing, uh, having covered this, that uh, the government and Mo uh, uh, might have to deal with uh, in, in the long run to ensure that as many people as possible are vaccinated? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for all young people in general, yeah, obviously, yeah. but I can speak to the people that I, I can speak for myself. all old people, though. So like... <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. 
Um, but yeah, it's like a lot of people my age are still like, let's get it. Like, we just want to go back to normal life, honestly, especially for young people. I think not being able to socialize is a really, really tough thing. So we want that back. Um, yeah, so a lot of us are really willing to get the vaccine as soon as we can. There are definitely people my age that are like, okay, but the risks for us aren't that great. And we're still a little hesitant that these vaccines work and they've been tested properly. So like, maybe we'll just wait it out. So I think there might be a lag in some young people getting the vaccine. They kind of, I don't know, maybe they'll wait a few extra months to see, I don't know, if people are like having crazy side effects or something. I don't know. Um, but I think once that time elapses and they realize that the vaccine will really get them back to normal life, especially if there's things they can't do without the vaccine, I think that would mm -hmm. push people mm -hmm. to get it. That's critical. If, that's, that's sure. Go ahead, Arthur. Yeah. If I could jump in, I, I think that's a major missed opportunity here in the country as a whole and in Saskatchewan to not have something like the approach that we've seen in Israel in terms of vaccine passports. I think there they call them green cards, where you can re-enter uh, you know, events, even large scale events that were previously restricted if you've been vaccinated, which creates a very powerful incentive for people to get vaccinated as soon as possible to go back to, you know, normal life. The prime minister here has been really hesitant about this for some reason, saying that it's an equity concern, uh, an equality concern, even though there's really only a few months delay between people that have access to the vaccine now as opposed to having access to the vaccine later. Uh, so I think that that's a missed opportunity. And uh, it, it, it could be interesting to see if, uh, if, if, if as the threat of variance becomes more substantial, whether the province decides to go in that direction. That's a, a great point, because we should literally have green cards in Saskatchewan. There should literally be vaccines. If you want to go into a Ryder game, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, in maybe July or August, I have my vaccine. I'm, I, I'm good to go as an incentive to uh, to do so. Now, I get the problem in terms of people's access and the relative fairness and et cetera, et cetera. But after a while, if you consider what lies ahead when the CFL uh, season starts, when what the, the government's ultimate goal is, which is that normality in Saskatchewan, which very much involves seeing the riders uh, play on Labor Day or seeing a lot of things going on, there's, there could be a little bit more incentive. I think the stick it to uh, the COVID campaign is good. But I think it would be a lot better if you actually had younger people basically involved. Like, you know, I, you know, I suggested one time get the Mark McMorris's, get the writers involved, get other people involved. Uh, do you think they might have to yet do that, guys? Do you think that, uh, that there's still a sell job in that regard? Well, it seems like they already are. I mean, they, they, they have, as you said, the, you know, stick it to COVID campaign where they've tried to get prominent uh, people uh, as part of their advertising effort. And as of now, I, I think that there's still enough interest um, and enough that can be done just through that sort of marketing and persuasion that more drastic efforts don't really need to be considered at this point. But as we get uh, to some of those younger age groups and if we do see um, you know, hesitancy because of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the concerns that some people do have about it, we might need to consider things like vaccine passports. And in my opinion, uh, it, 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 it makes sense even beyond uh, the question of incentives. I mean, if someone is truly protected against COVID and has had both of their vaccine boosters, I don't really see the rationale for continuing to have them subject to restrictions going forward. It seems to me uh, undue and unjustified, even if there are certain equality concerns that we could raise. Uh, Lynn, I'm sensing the a lot of hostility this week. There's always been a lot of hostility related to COVID, surrounding COVID, in terms of people's reluctance, their frustration with lockdowns, etc. But it goes back to maybe what you talked about initially in terms of its spread elsewhere and where it's uh, spreading. From the feedback that you've been getting for your stories or your difficulty in doing them or the government explanations to your stories, do you sense that growing divide and frustration uh, within the public and maybe within areas of the province uh, is to uh, uh, reluctance to uh, to want to proceed to do other things other than maybe vac vaccinate. Uh, I, I think maybe we're looking at a situation where a second lockdown would be very difficult in the first place, but incredibly difficult in certain smaller communities in uh, smaller cities and smaller communities in the province that quite ha they haven't uh, quite experienced the outbreak elsewhere. Is is that a sense right now, or is it just something I'm imagining? <laughs> 
No, I'm sure it, I'm sure it's there. I mean, smaller communities that haven't had COVID experiences the same way that larger centers have, I think it's always been a struggle kind of connecting in their minds that like this could hit you too, even if it hasn't yet. Um, so that's probably the same with variants of concern now rising too. Um, that being said, I think a lot of communities, when they look at the provincial numbers as a whole, then they look at Regina, they're just kind of like, that's ah, a mess in Regina, everywhere else is fine. And maybe people are getting a little bit lax in other areas that aren't being as hard hit. Um, and I think that's something Dr. Shahab is increasingly warned against saying like, hey, things can change very rapidly for you too. Like, don't, don't let up now, um, especially as vaccines are coming in. Like, I mean, that's been Premier Scott Moe's rhetoric the whole way through, right? Like, just hang in there till vaccines, hang in there till vaccines. And uh, I think that becomes an increasingly important message as we see variants of concern. Are there, we, we have a few minutes left and we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on this, but the budget's coming up this week. So how does what, what Lynn is talking about play into the budget messaging? Because we know it'll be a deficit budget. Well, we know that the economy is not doing particularly well and that one really legitimate reason Scott Moe wants things to open up and and get going again is because as a province, we need to create jobs and we need to, uh, a better financial situation to deal with this ongoing debt and deficit we have. How has COVID and how will COVID change the budgeting messaging that you that you expect to hear in, uh, uh, I guess, Tuesday now, uh, that uh, beyond the obvious reality that it'll be a co another COVID budget where it won't be presented quite in the same way, but uh, what what do you expect to be here and be emphasized more so than than maybe we've seen in past budgets that have that deal directly related to dealing with the COVID problem? Yeah, um, COVID is clearly going to be the pretext or the excuse, if you want to put it that way, uh, for the government uh, ditching its four-year balanced budget commitment. I think we can uh, be absolutely uh, confident that uh, that COVID will play a role in that respect uh, because uh, we know that there's no longer necessarily going to be a four-year path to return to balance in this budget that's going to be presented on Tuesday. Uh, I think it's clear that it's going to be framed as a recovery budget. Uh, this is the uh, government making investments to try to get the economy back on track to take advantage of the opportunities in a world that's bouncing back uh, from the COVID induced downturn. I think that's gonna be a very uh, clear messaging uh, train for the government. Uh, but that being said, I mean, really the province's recovery is completely dependent on what happens in world markets, what happens with oil, what happens with potash prices, what happens with the harvest. Uh, there's really not a ton that the government uh, can do about those things in terms of new investments. Uh, really what they've got to do is, 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 is try to make some investments to make sure that the system is resilient for the kinds of health crises that we saw over the past year. And that's clearly what the NDP is going to be hammering them on. And uh, to me, one of the things that I'm going to be watching for is whether there's investments in healthcare, in education, uh, to uh, to uh, create protections and, 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 and to really ensure that the province is better prepared for uh, a crisis of the sort that we saw this year. That's a great observation. And sadly, we have to leave it there because we're running out of time. But I think we'll be talking more about the budget next week as we go forward. Sharpen your pencils, kids. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Lynn, to Arthur today, and we'll see you next week on Inside the Marble Palace. Thanks so much, Maria. Yeah.